Chapter One. Jessica Wakefield rode her bicycle down her shady, tree-lined street. She turned into the driveway of her split-level ranch house and let herself in through the kitchen door. The first person she saw was her 14-year-old brother, Stephen. He was standing by the refrigerator with a basketball tucked under one arm, gulping down a soda. Stephen, guess what I saw at the mall today? Jessica said eagerly. A UFO, Stephen suggested with a smirk. No, silly, she said. I saw just the sweater I've been looking for. The most perfect sweater. The most perfect sweater, he mimicked in a high voice. Oh, Mom, I'll just die if I can't have it. He tossed his empty soda can into the trash and burst out laughing. Stephen! Cheska swiped at him, but he jumped out of reach. He was still laughing as he ran out the back door. Cheska frowned. She should have known better than to expect Stephen to care about her news. All he lived for was basketball and food. Cheska put down her books and walked into the living room. From there, she could hear her mother and her twin sister, Elizabeth, talking in the den. You know, Mom, I love working on the Sweet Valley Sixers, Elizabeth was saying. But someday I want to write other things, too. I'd like to write a horse story, like Black Beauty. Well, why don't you give it a try, Mrs. Wakefield said. You have a terrific imagination. I know you'd do a good job. Jessica rolled her eyes. Sometimes Elizabeth can be so dull, she thought. All she ever talks about is reading, writing, and that dumb old sixth grade newspaper. Jessica and Elizabeth were identical twins. They both had long, sun-streaked blonde hair, blue-green eyes, and a tiny dimple in their left cheeks. But that is where the similarities ended. Since entering Sweet Valley Middle School, they no longer dressed alike. Elizabeth wore her hair pulled back from her face. Her clothes were casual, and she never bothered with makeup. But Jessica had started to wear her hair down in loose waves. Her clothes were always coordinated and fashionable, and she wore lip gloss and a touch of mascara as well. The girls were different in other ways, too. Elizabeth was thoughtful. She loved to read and have long talks with her friends. Jessica, however, was impatient and moved more quickly. She loved clothes and gossip, and she spent all her free time with the unicorns, an exclusive club made up of all of her good friends. Elizabeth thought Jessica's friends were stuck up, and Jessica thought Elizabeth's friends were too serious. But deep down, the twins respected their differences, and they were the best of friends. Elizabeth and her mother were still talking when Jessica came barreling into the den. Guess what, she announced, barely containing her excitement. I saw the most beautiful sweater at the mall today. Elizabeth was sitting on the couch. I'll bet it's purple, she said with a smile. Purple was the Unicorn Club's favorite color, and all the members tried to wear something purple every day. Elizabeth thought it was a silly idea. It's pale, pale violet, Jessica said, with a white unicorn embroidered across the front. She turned to her mother. Oh, Mom, if I had that sweater, all of the unicorns would be so jealous. I've got to have it. It sounds lovely. Mrs. Wakefield said, easing back in a recliner chair. But can we talk about it later? I had a rough day at work, and I feel terribly tired. But Mom, Jessica began, I called your father, and he's bringing home Chinese food for dinner, Mrs. Wakefield continued. I think I'll just take a short nap before he gets here. She rested her head against the back of the chair and yawned. 
Come on, Elizabeth whispered. She stood up and took Jessica's arm. Let's let mom get some rest. Jessica frowned and followed Elizabeth out of the room. She felt angry and hurt. Her mother had just spent plenty of time talking with Elizabeth, but as soon as Jessica wanted to talk, her mother had no time. You know, I'm worried about mom, Elizabeth said after they had left the room. She seems awfully tired lately. So, Jessica said irritably. It's just funny, that's all, Elizabeth said with a shrug. Mom never takes a nap before dinner. Well, it doesn't surprise me, Jessica said. Your nonstop talking probably wore her out. Elizabeth looked hurt, but Jessica didn't care. She didn't like being ignored, especially by her own mother. Jessica went into the kitchen and poured herself some juice. Then she had an idea. Maybe she could make a special dessert for dinner. That way, her mother would surely pay attention to her. Eagerly, she opened the closet and took out the Unicorn Celebrity Cookbook. A few months ago, the club had written letters to celebrities in order to find out their favorite recipes. Then they collected the recipes into a book and sold it to raise money for a dance. Jessica flipped through the book until she came to a recipe for chocolate parfait sent in by movie star Leslie Morgan. It looked easy and quick. She got out the ingredients and set to work. At dinner, Mr. Wakefield told the family he had an announcement to make. I'm going to New York City on business in a few days, he said. I'll be gone for about two weeks. What case are you working on? Stephen asked between bites of egg roll. Mr. Wakefield was a successful lawyer with an office in Sweet Valley. It's for the Mighty Good Chocolate Company in Los Angeles. They think a company in New York has stolen their coconut candy bar recipe. I'm going to meet with the New York company and see if we can work things out. And will you get to sample a lot of candy bars while you're there? Elizabeth asked. I'll save that job for your mother, Mr. Wakefield said. She's coming with me for the first week of the trip. We've asked your great aunt Shirley to come to Sweet Valley and look after you. I hope I can shake this cold before we leave, Mrs. Wakefield said. She rubbed her eyes. I won't make a very good traveling companion if I feel this worn out. Mr. Wakefield looked concerned. That cold has been dragging on for some time. Don't you think you'd better see the doctor? I will if I don't feel better soon. Jessica tapped her fingers against the table. She was impatient for the meal to end so she could surprise her mother with dessert. Then, when everyone had finished telling her how delicious it tasted, Jessica would ask her parents for the money to buy the unicorn sweater. Finally, Mr. Wakefield pushed back his chair. I'll be in my study, he said. I have a lot of paperwork to do for my trip. Wait, Jessica cried. I made a special dessert. It's chocolate parfait. Yum, exclaimed Elizabeth. Stephen groaned. Ugh, if Jessica made it, it probably tastes like mud. Stephen, Mr. Wakefield scolded. He turned to Jessica. That sounds delicious, Jessica. I'll take mine with me into the study. Jessica looked expectantly at her mother, but Mrs. Wakefield just smiled and said, That was a nice surprise, honey, but I'm too full to eat another bite. She yawned and added, I'm going upstairs to lie down. But mom, Jessica began, I wanted to ask you about that sweater. Mrs. Wakefield stood up and patted Jessica's shoulder. Ask me later, okay? Before Jessica could answer, her mother turned and walked out of the room. Jessica spent the evening in her bedroom doing her homework. She was having trouble concentrating, though. Why is mom ignoring me, she wondered, feeling frustrated and unhappy. It just wasn't fair. 
Just then, there was a knock at her bedroom door. Can I come in? Elizabeth asked through the door. No, go away, Jessica said grumpily. There was no reason to be angry with Elizabeth, but she couldn't help it. It bothered her that her mother had taken the time to talk to Elizabeth, but not to her. It's important, Elizabeth said. I want to talk to you. Oh, all right, Jessica muttered. Come in, but make it quick. I'm busy. Elizabeth opened the door and walked into Jessica's room. Until recently, the girls had shared a bedroom. That was when Elizabeth thought twins should do everything together. Now she was glad she had her own room because she liked things neat and orderly. Her books were carefully arranged on her bookshelves and her clothes were hung neatly in her closet. Jessica's room, on the other hand, looked as if a cyclone had just passed through. Clothes were strewn across the floor, papers were spilling off the desk, and there were magazines and bubble gum wrappers on the bed. It's about mom, Elizabeth said, closing the door behind her. She pushed aside a pile of fashion magazines and sat down on her sister's bed. Does she seem any different to you? How should I know? You're the one she talks to, not me. Elizabeth frowned. What do you mean? She hasn't paid any attention to me all day, Jessica complained. I tried to tell her about the sweater I saw at the mall, but she was barely listening. She'd rather listen to you. That's not true, Elizabeth answered. Mom hasn't had much time for me either. Just yesterday, I asked her if she'd help me hem my new jeans, but she told me she was too tired. Then tonight after dinner, I took some tea to her and she dozed off while I was in there. Jessica wasn't about to dismiss the whole thing so easily. But the more she thought about it, the more it seemed that Elizabeth was right. Their mother did seem unusually tired lately, and she seemed to have less time for both of them. Remember last weekend when Dad drove us up to Seca Lake? She said at last. Mom didn't feel like coming with us. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Elizabeth said. Mom just hasn't been herself lately. Well, she has a cold. At least, that's what she said at dinner, Jessica said, hopefully. I know, Elizabeth answered, but she isn't sneezing or coughing. She only seems tired all the time. Just then, Mr. Wakeville knocked at the door. Girls, he called, time for bed. Normally, Jessica liked having her own room just as much as Elizabeth did, but right now, she wished her twin didn't have to leave. She wanted to keep talking. Elizabeth stood up. Okay, Daddy, I'm on my way. She turned to her sister and gave her a sympathetic look. We'll talk some more tomorrow. Then she walked through the bathroom that separated the twins' bedroom and closed the door. After Elizabeth left, Jessica changed into her nightgown and thought about what her sister had said. Maybe Mom isn't ignoring me after all, she decided. She got into bed and pulled the covers up to her chin. Her mother had been complaining about her cold for weeks. But if it was just a simple cold, why was it dragging on for so long? Jessica couldn't shake the uneasy feeling in the pit of her stomach. Closing her eyes, she lay there a long time before she finally drifted off to sleep. Chapter 2. Jessica, Elizabeth, wake up, girls, Mrs. Wakefield called, knocking on the twins' bedroom doors. I'm leaving for work early today so I can catch up on a few things. Jessica opened her eyes and glanced at her alarm clock. It was 7.30. Normally, her mother's part-time job at Sweet Valley Design didn't start until 9 o'clock. Good, Jessica thought. If mom's leaving for work this early, she must be feeling better. Mom wouldn't be going to work if she didn't feel well, Jessica announced happily to her sister on their way to school. Especially not so early. I guess you're right, Jessica agreed as they crossed the street to the Sweet Valley Middle School lawn. It just seems... 
But before she could continue, a boy on a bike came whizzing out of nowhere. Out of my way, he yelled, pedaling toward them. Jessica and Elizabeth leaped to the sidewalk just in time. Watch where you're going, Jessica shouted as the boy tore off down the street. Who was that? Elizabeth asked, struggling to catch her breath. Dennis Cookman, I think, Jessica answered. Dennis was a seventh grader, but he looked big enough to be in high school. He was tall with broad shoulders. He only missed us by a couple of inches, Elizabeth said. Jessica made a face. <sighs> what a jerk. When the twins reached the wide, grassy lawn, they split up, as they did almost every morning. Elizabeth went off to talk to her friends on the staff of the Sweet Valley Sixers, while Jessica hurried to find her fellow unicorns. Ever since she'd been asked to join the unicorns at the beginning of sixth grade, Jessica had felt special. They were the prettiest and most popular girls in school. And since most of them were seventh and eighth graders, being with them made Jessica feel very important. Today, Leela Fowler and Ellen Reitman were standing beside the flagpole, talking and laughing. Jessica hurried to join them. Did you hear the news? Ellen asked eagerly as Jessica walked up. The school is doing a production of Carnival. Auditions are in two weeks. Isn't that a musical? What's it about? Jessica asked. I watched the video last month on my new projection TV, Leela Fowler said importantly. Leela was from one of the wealthier families in Sweet Valley, and she loved to brag about the expensive things her father bought her. It's about an orphan girl named Lily. She joins a traveling carnival and falls in love with a handsome magician. Ooh, it sounds romantic, Cheska exclaimed. It is, Leela said with a nod. The magician breaks her heart, and she ends up with a puppeteer who always loved her. Jessica started to imagine herself as the star of Carnival. She pictured herself up on the stage, sobbing because the cruel magician had broken her heart. It sounded so dramatic. The musical was going to be the most thrilling thing that had happened at Sweet Valley Middle School in ages. By the time she reached her homeroom, Jessica knew she had to be a part of it. At lunch, Jessica joined her friends at their regular table. Did you hear? Kimberly Haver asked, pushing back her thick black hair. Dennis Cookman stole Jimmy Underwood's bicycle. Jessica's eyes widened. I saw Dennis Cookman riding a bike this morning. He practically ran Lizzie and me over. Do you think it was Jimmy's bike? It must have been, Kimberly said. Jimmy parked his bike outside the Elm Street Quick Mart while he went in to buy a comic book. When he walked out, Dennis was riding away on it. Dennis is going to get in big trouble, Ellen Reitman said. Leela shrugged. I'm not so sure. Jimmy is really shy. He probably won't even tell on Dennis. Besides, Dennis is about twice his size. The girls ate in silence for a minute. Then Jessica said... Just two weeks until the carnival auditions. Doesn't it sound exciting? Someone from the unicorns should audition for the lead, Janet Howell said. Janet was president of the unicorns, and she liked to make sure the club members were always the center of attention. That's right, Kimberly said, taking a sip of milk. The girl who plays Lily should be very pretty and very special, just like the unicorns. Well, who in the unicorns is a good actress? Janet asked. Jessica is, Ellen piped up. She looked at Jessica. You danced the lead in your ballet recital, right? But that was dancing, not acting, Janet protested. I had to act too, Jessica said proudly. The other girls played life-size dolls, but I was the heroine, Swinilda. That sounds like a scene from Carnival. Leela said excitedly, Lily dreams that the puppeteer's puppets have come to life. She does a dance with them. Oh, Jess, you'd be perfect, Kimberly exclaimed. Jessica could hardly contain her excitement. The role did sound perfect for her. 
she pictured herself on stage, dancing with the life-size puppets and the audience jumping to their feet to give her a standing ovation. I heard Dana Larson talking about the auditions in gym class today, Ellen said. She said she's going to try out for the part of Lily. Dana was a tall, thin girl with short blonde hair and a pointy chin. She had a strong, clear soprano voice. But she's not as pretty as Jessica, Ellen remarked. Jessica smiled. She loved the unicorns. Being in such an exclusive club made her feel wanted and special. It almost made her feel better than girls like Dana Larson. And if I win the role of Lily, she thought, that will prove it. Did you see the latest copy of the Sweet Valley Sixers? Ellen said, pulling the newspaper out of her backpack. Listen to what it says in Caroline Pierce's gossip column. She opened the paper and read, Dana Larson will be trying out for the part of Lily and Bruce Patman is a shoo-in for the role of the magician. Jessica's eyes widened. Bruce Patman was the cutest boy in the whole seventh grade. Bruce is so dreamy, Janet cried. Imagine if you got the part, Jessica, Kimberly said. You might even get to kiss him. The girls all burst into excited giggles. Can't you just picture it, Ellen said, turning to Jessica. You and Bruce step to the edge of the stage for the curtain call. The audience is cheering and Bruce hands you a bouquet of beautiful red roses. Right then and there, Jessica decided she was going to get that part, no matter what. After school, Jessica went to Madame Andre's studio for her ballet lesson. Jessica, Madame Andre said before the class began, your mother has called. She's not feeling well today, so she arranged for you to ride home with Carrie Glenn. Jessica frowned. This morning she had been positive her mother was feeling much better, but now she wasn't so sure. She thought about what Elizabeth had said the night before. Mom just hasn't been herself lately. It was true. It just wasn't like her mother to be sick for so long. Carrie was at the bar doing her stretching exercises. Jessica joined her. She stretched her leg across the bar and leaned over until her head was resting on her knee. Hi, Carrie said. She tossed her long, dark braid over her shoulder and smiled. Madame Andre told me you're getting a ride with me today. Jessica nodded. My mother's sick. That's too bad. What's wrong? I'm not sure, Jessica said between stretches. Mostly she's just tired all the time. Uh-oh, sounds exactly like my mom. She was dragging around for weeks before she found out what was wrong with her. What was it? Jessica asked with interest. She was pregnant. Jessica laughed. No way, my mom couldn't be pregnant. That's what I thought too, Carrie replied. But now I have a baby brother. Jessica swallowed hard. Suddenly, she wasn't so sure what to believe. After all, if it had happened to Carrie's mother, maybe it could happen to her mother too. How did your mom act? She asked anxiously. I mean, did she take a lot of naps? Yes, and she always seemed to be kind of grumpy. Oh, and she felt sick to her stomach. Jessica could hardly believe her ears. Her mother was acting exactly like that. Not only had she been tired lately, but she had been grumpy too. Could she have passed up Jessica's special dessert because she felt sick to her stomach? Jessica spent her entire ballet class thinking about this new possibility. When class ended, she changed out of her leotard and walked outside with Carrie. What's it like having a baby brother? She asked. Horrible, Carrie moaned. All he does is eat, sleep, cry, and dirty his diapers. And yesterday he spit up all over my homework. The girls looked up as Mrs. Glenn's car appeared around the corner. A small baby was sitting in a car seat in the back, screaming and crying. Hurry up, girls, Mrs. Glenn called, pulling up to the curb. It's time for the baby's feeding. Carrie, see if you can keep him quiet until we get home. 
Jessica's stomach started to churn. She climbed into the back seat and glanced over at Carrie's baby brother. His face was bright red and he was shrieking so loudly it made her ears hurt. Mom can't be pregnant, Jessica thought anxiously. She just isn't. Then she crossed her fingers and added, I hope. Chapter 3 When Jessica got home, she found Elizabeth and Stephen in the kitchen. Hi, Jess, Elizabeth said, carrying a pot of water from the sink to the stove. Mom asked us to start dinner. She's upstairs, lying down. Lizzie, Jessica said, rushing to her sister's side. Something awful is happening. Stephen looked up from the tomato he was cutting. What's wrong, he asked. Did you get a run in your tights or something? This isn't funny, Jessica insisted. I think, well, maybe mom's going to have a baby, she blurted out. A baby, Elizabeth gasped. She turned from the stove and stared at her sister. You've got to be kidding. I'm not, Jessica answered urgently. Listen, she's tired all the time, right? Well, so was Carrie Glenn's mother. And then it turned out Mrs. Glenn was pregnant. Who's pregnant? Mrs. Wakefield asked, walking into the kitchen. Our brilliant sister says you are, Stephen answered. Mrs. Wakefield laughed. What in the world gave you that idea? You've been so tired lately, Jessica began. I was just worried. Well, don't be, Mrs. Wakefield said, giving Jessica an affectionate hug. I'm just a little run down, that's all. Just give me a few more days and I'll be back to normal. Stephen went back to cutting tomatoes. A baby, he said, smirking. Poor Jessica, you sure come up with some dumb ideas. I'm just glad I was wrong. Jessica replied. She made a face at Stephen and added, One brother is enough. Yeah, well, one sister is enough too, he shot back. So why don't you do us all a favor and... All right, you two, Mrs. Wakefield interrupted. Then she smiled and said, I can take over from here. Thanks for your help. Are you sure? Elizabeth asked. Absolutely. I'm feeling much better. Now, go on. I'll call you when dinner's ready. Elizabeth and Stephen left the kitchen, but Jessica stayed. She was so relieved her mother wasn't pregnant that she felt like cheering. She grabbed a spoon and sampled the spaghetti sauce her mother was stirring. Hmm, she said, delicious. Mrs. Wakefield tasted a spoonful. Not bad, not bad at all. She smiled and added, Set the table, please. We'll be eating in 10 minutes. It was Elizabeth's turn to set the table, but Jessica was feeling too happy to complain. Guess what, Mom, she announced. We're putting on a production of Carnival at school, and I'm going to audition for the lead. That sounds like fun, Mrs. Wakefield said. She handed Jessica a stack of plates. Carnival has always been one of my favorite musicals, I remember seeing the movie when I was about your age. I knew all the songs by heart. Jessica walked into the dining room and began setting the table. Maybe they could rent the movie from the video store at the mall, she thought. Then suddenly she remembered that there was something else she wanted from the mall. Something much more exciting than a videotape. Remember that sweater I told you about? She called to her mother. The one I saw in the mall? Yes, I seem to remember you saying something about a sweater, Mrs. Wakefield replied. It's beautiful, Mom, Jessica said eagerly. It's violet with a white unicorn embroidered across the front. She walked back into the kitchen. Mom, it's just perfect for me. Mrs. Wakefield looked up from her spaghetti sauce. How much does it cost, she asked. Well, um, not much, really. 
just uh, $40. Mrs. Wakefield frowned. That's quite a bit of money, especially for something you don't really need. But Mom, Jessica cried, I do need it. Don't you see? Any unicorn would die to have a sweater like that one. And there was only one in the whole store. Can't I have it, Mom? Please? I'll tell you what, Mrs. Wakefield said. If you save your allowance until you have $20, your father and I will give you the rest. Jessica groaned. She hated saving money. In fact, she usually spent her allowance the same day she got it. But Mom, she pleaded, it will take me weeks and weeks to save that much money. And by that time, the sweater will be gone. Couldn't you just buy it for me and let me pay you back later? That wouldn't teach you the value of saving, Mrs. Wakefield said calmly. Now, come on, honey, finish setting the table. Jessica sighed loudly. It just wasn't fair. It was going to take forever to save the money to buy the sweater if one of the other girls in the unicorns didn't buy it first. It's Elizabeth's turn to set the table, Jessica called grumpily. Ask her to finish. Then she turned and stomped out of the room. When the twins walked into their homeroom the next morning, their teacher, Mr. Davis, was standing by the door. Line up, everyone, he said. There's no homeroom this morning. We're having a special assembly instead. Something about the school musical. Are you going to try out? Jessica asked Elizabeth as the class walked down the hall to the auditorium. No, I don't think so, Elizabeth replied. But I'm going to write a series about the show for the Sixers. Sort of a behind-the-scenes look at the whole production. One article will be about the scenery, then the costumes, the music, the stars. Then you can interview me, Jessica said. I'm trying out for the lead. That's great, Jess, Elizabeth exclaimed, giving her twin's arm a squeeze. Good luck. When everyone was seated in the auditorium, Mr. Clark, the principal, walked out onto the stage. Carnival will be the middle school's first musical production, he said proudly. And we're all very excited, but to make it a success, we need everyone's help. And now, I'll let Ms. McDonald tell you how you can get involved. Ms. McDonald, the school's music teacher, stepped up to the microphone. Jessica sat up straight in her chair and listened closely. Auditions will be after school a week from Friday, Miss McDonald began. You will be judged on your acting and singing ability. Everyone who's trying out should come prepared to sing one song. It doesn't need to be a song from a carnival, just a song that shows off your voice. Remember, a musical succeeds or fails on the strength of its singing. We need voices that will make the audience sit up and take notice. We also need help with scenery, costumes, publicity, and much, much more. Miss McDonald was still talking, but Jessica was too busy thinking about the audition to listen. It wasn't the acting that concerned her. She was pretty sure she could handle that. It was the singing. Jessica twirled a strand of hair around her fingers thoughtfully. Her voice wasn't bad. She knew that. She could carry a tune, and she almost never sang off-key. But was it the kind of voice that would make an audience sit up and take notice? And, even more important, was it as good as Dana Larson's? When the assembly ended, Jessica walked out of the auditorium and looked for the other unicorns. Instead, she saw Caroline Pierce. Caroline was the biggest gossip at Sweet Valley Middle School. Her weekly column in the Sweet Valley Sixers was full of juicy rumors about students and teachers, and she was always in search of new tidbits. Hi, Jessica, she called, pushing through the crowd. Did you hear about Jimmy Underwood? What about him? When he walked out of his house this morning, he found his bike lying on the front lawn. The handlebars were bent, and it had two flat tires. I bet Dennis Cookman ran it into a tree or something, Jessica said. 
The way he was riding yesterday, I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, I heard he almost ran you over. Caroline patted her long red hair and fixed her sharp green eyes on Jessica. And that's not all I heard. Janet Howell told me you're trying out for the lead in Carnival. Jessica nodded. That's right. Ooh, how exciting. That makes you and Dana Larson the two top contenders. She paused thoughtfully. Of course, Dana does have a fabulous voice. She moved closer to Jessica and whispered, but I overheard Bruce Patman telling Charlie Cashman he wanted you to get the part. You did? Jessica asked breathlessly. Caroline smiled and nodded. Oh, there's Elise, she said suddenly, catching sight of her friend. See you later, Jess, she called, hurrying into the crowd. Jessica walked down the hall barely noticing the people around her. According to Caroline's gossip column, Bruce Patman was a shoo-in for the role of the magician, and he wanted Jessica to be Lily. At dinner that evening, Mr. Wakefield told the family that he was leaving for New York the following morning. I'll be on my way to the airport before any of you kids are awake, he said so we'll have to say goodbye to each other tonight. But when is Aunt Sally coming? Elizabeth asked. She's not, Mrs. Wakefield answered. Your father and I talked it over, and we decided I'm going to stay here. Are you kidding? Stephen exclaimed. And give up a chance to eat all those candy bars? Mrs. Wakefield smiled. I'd rather go, believe me. But the silly cold has made me fall behind at work and I just can't afford to take time off. Besides, I'm really not up to a big trip right now. But are you sure you're up to taking care of three children all by yourself? Mr. Wakefield asked. Don't be silly, Ned. I'm not that sick. Well, all right, Mr. Wakefield said, looking worried. But call me in New York if you have any problems. I can always come home early if I have to. Jessica exchanged a look with her sister. Her parents' conversation was making her uneasy, and from the way Elizabeth was frowning, Jessica knew she felt the same way. Mr. Wakefield turned to the twins and Stephen. Be good while I'm gone. Help your mother out, and don't give her any trouble, okay? But before they could answer, Mrs. Wakefield smiled mischievously and said, Oh, don't worry about us. We're going to have a great time while you're gone, aren't we, kids? We'll eat chocolate cake for dinner, and we'll stay up all night and watch videos. <laughs> right, Stephen laughed, joining in. And we'll throw a big party and invite the entire high school. And we won't wash any dishes, Mrs. Wakefield cried. We'll just leave them for your father when he gets home. By now, the whole family was laughing. Jessica joined in eagerly. Looking around the table at her parents' happy faces, it seemed silly to be worried. But deep inside, she still wished her father didn't have to go away. Chapter 4 Two days later, Jessica was riding her bike home from school. As she pedaled, she practiced a song she had chosen to sing at her carnival audition. It was an upbeat number called Look At Me from Shout, a musical she'd seen in Los Angeles. Hey world, she sang as she rode along. Look at me, me, me. I'm going to shout what I'm about for everyone to see. Jessica sighed. Her voice was clear and true, but it sounded much too thin and delicate. She never win the lead if she sang like that. She threw her head back and tried again. Hey, world, she bellowed as she pedaled up the driveway to her house. Look at me, me, me. When Jessica walked in the kitchen door, she was still singing. Just then, the phone started to ring. Quickly, she tossed her books on the counter and answered it. Hello, a woman's voice said. This is Dr. Costa's office. Is Mrs. Wakefield there? 
Dr. Costa was the Wakefield's family doctor. Why would Dr. Costa's office be calling, she wondered. Uh, Mrs. Wakefield isn't here right now, she said. Can I take a message? Just tell her we have the results of her blood test, the woman replied. Jessica's heart thudded against her ribs. She hadn't heard anything about her mother going to the doctor for a blood test. Suddenly, an awful thought came to her. What if her mother didn't have a cold? What if she was really sick? Sicker than anyone realized? Jessica, Mrs. Wakefield called from upstairs. Who's on the phone? Jessica gasped with surprise. She hadn't expected her mother to be home yet. Thinking quickly, she said to the woman on the phone, Hold on, my mother just walked in the door. Then she held the receiver away from her ear and called upstairs. It's for you, Mom. Jessica knew she should hang up as soon as she heard her mother's voice. Still, if her mother was really sick, Jessica felt she had a right to know. Hello, she heard her mother say into the phone. This is Alice Wakefield. Jessica pressed her hand over the mouthpiece and listened. Mrs. Wakefield, this is Dr. Costa's office. We have the results of your blood test. Everything looks fine except your white blood cell count. It's slightly elevated. What does that mean? Mrs. Wakefield asked. Probably nothing, but Dr. Costa would like you to make an appointment to have that lump on your neck biopsied, just in case. Can you come in tomorrow? Quietly, Jessica hung up the phone. She had no idea what all this meant but it sounded kind of scary. She was still standing by the phone when Elizabeth and Stephen came in through the back door. What's the matter with you? Stephen asked. You look like your best friend just died. This is no time to make jokes, Jessica snapped. Elizabeth frowned. What's wrong, Jess? You look upset. Dr. Costa's office just called to talk to Mom, Jessica said in a near whisper. I heard the woman say, you mean you listened in on the conversation? Elizabeth exclaimed. Jessica, that's not very nice. What's not very nice? Mrs. Wakefield asked, coming into the kitchen. Jessica wasn't sure what to say. If she admitted she had overheard the phone conversation, her mother would be angry with her. But if she didn't, how could she find out if her mother was really sick? Finally, she said, I didn't know you were home. So when I answered the phone just now, I asked the lady if I could take a message. She said she had the results of your blood test. A blood test, Elizabeth asked. What for? Yeah, Stephen said. What's going on, Mom? Probably nothing, Mrs. Wakefield replied. Let's go into the dining room and I'll explain. Jessica, Elizabeth, and Stephen sat down solemnly at the dining room table. At work yesterday, I was still feeling very tired, Mrs. Wakefield began. At first, I just assumed it was because of my cold. But as the morning went on, I felt worse. I was achy and hot, and finally I had to come home. That afternoon, I went to see Dr. Costa. He said I had a lump on the back of my neck that was a swollen lymph node, and he gave me a blood test. The nurse just called to tell me the test isn't completely normal. What does that mean? Jessica asked anxiously. We don't know yet, Mrs. Wakefield said gently. It probably means I have some kind of virus. When the virus is gone, the lump will disappear. When will you know for sure, Mom? Elizabeth asked. Soon. Tomorrow, Dr. Costa is going to do some more tests. When he gets the results, he'll know what to do. Are you going to call Dad tonight? Stephen asked. Maybe he'll want to come home early. Mrs. Wakefield shook her head. I'll talk to him later this week. There's no need for him to come home for something as minor as this. But Mom, Jessica asked, are you sure you're going to be all right? Of course I am, honey. Mrs. Wakefield reached out and squeezed Jessica's hand. I'm going to be just fine, I promise. Jessica smiled. The touch of her mother's hand was reassuring. Mrs. Wakefield stood up from the dining room table. 
I think I'll go upstairs now and rest a bit. Can you three get dinner ready? There's a chicken casserole in the refrigerator. It just needs to be heated up. That and a salad ought to be enough. Sure, Mom, Stephen said. No problem. Do you think Mom will be okay? Elizabeth asked after their mother had left. Sure, Stephen said confidently. Like she said, it's probably nothing. He was smiling, but there was a worried look in his eyes. I guess we'll just have to wait until tomorrow, Elizabeth said. Jessica looked across at Elizabeth and Stephen and then stood up abruptly. Just listen to you two, she said. Sitting around worrying isn't going to help anything. It's up to us to take care of things until Mom feels better. Now, what can we do to help out? Make dinner, Stephen said. I mean, that's what Mom told us to do, right? That's a good start, Jessica replied. Stephen, I want you to take the casserole out of the refrigerator and put it in the oven. Then you can make a salad. Hey, why me? Stephen demanded. I don't know anything about cooking. Stephen, Jessica scolded. This is no time to act like a baby. Mom is sick and she needs our help. Jessica is right, Elizabeth said. Just doing our regular chores isn't enough right now. We all have to pitch in and do whatever is needed. Right, Jessica agreed. That's why I want you to go down to the laundry room and put in a load of wash. My red cotton blouse needs ironing, too. Mom said she'd do it, but I can't ask her now. Will you take care of it, Lizzie? Well, all right, Elizabeth answered slowly. But what are you going to be doing? I'm going upstairs to see if Mom needs anything. She walked purposefully out of the room and headed upstairs. Mrs. Wakefield was sitting in bed, reading a magazine. Hi, Mom, Jessica said, walking into the room. I just came up to see how you're doing. Oh, thanks, honey, her mother said. I feel a little achy, but other than that, I'm fine. Let me fluff up your pillows, Jessica said. Mrs. Wakefield leaned forward while Jessica straightened the sheets and rearranged the pillows. While she worked, she said, I don't want you to worry about the house while you're feeling sick, Mom. I'll take care of everything. You just rest and get better, okay? That's very thoughtful of you, Jessica, Mrs. Wakefield said. Jessica beamed with pleasure. Of course, she wasn't really planning to do all the work around the house by herself. Elizabeth and Stephen would help, too. But she would organize everything. And as far as Jessica was concerned, that was the most important job of all. Mom, she said, sitting on the edge of the bed, I've been working on a song for my carnival audition. Can I sing it for you? Why, of course, honey, Mrs. Wakefield replied. I'd love to hear it. Jessica cleared her throat, threw her head back, and sang, Hey, world, look at me, me, me. Downstairs in the laundry room, Elizabeth tossed a load of clothes into the washing machine and turned it on. Then, with a sigh, she turned on the iron and set to work on Jessica's shirt. When she was finished, she walked up to the kitchen to help Stephen with the salad. Where's Jessica? she asked. Upstairs, Stephen said with disgust. <laughs> She's been singing the same stupid song over and over for the last 15 minutes. Just then, Jessica's voice could be heard from the second floor singing, Hey world, look at me, me, me. How come she's singing while we're down here working? Stephen asked angrily. I thought she was going upstairs to see if mom needed anything. Yeah, well, it sounds like she's the one who needs something, Stephen muttered. Elizabeth giggled. She's trying out for the lead in the middle school musical. Maybe she's practicing for the audition. Well, it's not fair, Stephen said. She's bossing us around, telling us to do this and that. And what's she doing to help out around here? Nothing. He tossed down the vegetable peeler he was using to peel carrots. I'm going upstairs to tell Mom. 
Wait, Elizabeth said, grabbing his arm. We shouldn't bother her with our problems right now. You mean you're going to let Jessica boss you around? Elizabeth frowned. I don't like it any better than you do, but mom needs rest and she's not going to get any if we're fighting all the time. I guess you're right, Stephen said reluctantly, but it's just not fair. Just then, Jessica walked into the kitchen, humming the chorus of, look at me. When she saw Elizabeth and Stephen, she stopped. Hey, you two, knock off the small talk. We're supposed to be getting dinner ready. That's what I've been doing, Stephen said, unlike some people I know. I've been taking care of mom, Jessica said haughtily. And now I'm going to sit down and make a list of all the chores that need to be done around here. Then we can divide them up among us. How come you get to sit around writing lists while I have to peel these stupid carrots? Stephen demanded. That's all right, Elizabeth interrupted, giving Stephen a sharp poke in the ribs. I'll peel them. Jessica, you go ahead and make your list. We'll take care of the salad. Jessica smiled with satisfaction. She knew she was being bossy, but she figured she had a good reason. Her mother was sick and there was a lot of work to be done. Someone has to run things around here until mom gets better, she told herself. So why shouldn't it be me? Chapter five. The next day was Saturday. Jessica got up early and set to work. First, she served her mother breakfast in bed. Then she woke up Elizabeth and Stephen and gave them their work assignments for the day. Elizabeth, I want you to vacuum the downstairs this morning, she said, glancing at the list of chores she had written the previous evening. But I plan to go horseback riding this morning, Elizabeth protested. She often rode her friend Ted Rogers' horse, Thunder, at Carson Stables. Well, you'll just have to change your plans, Jessica replied. We have too much work to do right here at home. Count me out, Stephen said. Joe Howell and I are meeting at school this morning to shoot baskets. Forget it, Jessica said curtly. She looked at her list. Today I want you to wash the van and mow the lawn. Oh yeah, Stephen said. And what are you going to do, little Miss Dictator? I'm going to Dr. Costa's office with Mom, she said. She should have someone from the family with her. And when we get back, I'll make lunch for her. But I thought you told me the unicorns were going shopping at the mall today, Elizabeth reminded her sister. Jessica had forgotten all about her shopping date with the unicorns. I'm not going, she said simply. Now let's get to work. Jessica walked downstairs and dialed Leela's number. I can't go to the mall today, she said when her friend picked up the phone. My mother is sick and I have to stay home and take care of her. Sick? Leela asked. What's wrong with her? We're not sure yet, Jessica said. She's going to the doctor for a test today. Suddenly, Jessica remembered the violet unicorn sweater. There was only one in the whole store. Jessica knew that if Leela saw it, she was sure to buy it. Leela? Jessica said, when you go to the mall this afternoon, don't even bother looking in the clothes horse. I was in there the other day and they didn't have anything interesting. Okay, thanks, Leela said. Tell your mother I hope she feels better. Bye. Later that morning, Jessica went to the doctor's office with her mother. It seemed like Mrs. Wakefield was in the examining room for an eternity. With each passing minute, Jessica felt more and more edgy. What could be taking so long? Then Jessica had an awful thought. Maybe Dr. Costa was in there right now, breaking some bad news to her mother. The more Jessica thought about it, the more sense it made. She glanced up at the clock behind the nurse's desk. Her mother had been in there for almost 45 minutes. What was Dr. Costa telling her mother? That she had to go into the hospital? Or 
Jessica's stomach tightened into a painful knot. Something even worse. Jessica couldn't stand waiting another second. She jumped up, determined to find out what was going on. But just then, her mother walked into the waiting room. Oh, Mom, Jessica cried, running to her side. What happened? Are you going to be all right? Of course I am, Mrs. Wakefield answered. Dr. Costa gave me a thorough examination and took some more blood for testing. That's all. She looked closely at Jessica. What's wrong, honey? You look upset. I am. I mean, I was. She gazed up into her mother's face. It's just... Oh, Mom, I was worried. You were in there so long, I thought maybe Dr. Costa had found something really wrong with you. Mrs. Wakefield put her arms around Jessica and hugged her tight. It's nothing like that, she said reassuringly. I'll have the test results in a few days. Until then, he just wants me to stay in bed and rest. Jessica leaned her head against her mother's shoulder. It felt good to be near her. Deep in the pit of her stomach, she still felt a little uneasy. But with her mother's arms around her, nothing seemed as horrible as she had imagined. Mrs. Wakefield put her arms on Jessica's shoulders and looked at her. I think you need something to get your mind off all this. In fact, we both do. Come on, she said, leading Jessica outside. Let's stop by the dairy burger on the way home. I feel in the mood for an ice cream soda. But I thought you were supposed to stay in bed for the next couple of days, Jessica said. That's all the more reason to go to the dairy burger, Mrs. Wakefield laughed. This is my last chance to have a little fun for a while. Now come on, what do you say? Jessica still felt a little uneasy. What if the test results showed that her mother had something seriously wrong with her? Relax, she told herself. She slipped her arm around her mother's waist. An ice cream soda sounds great, Mom, she said with a smile. Then Jessica remembered Elizabeth and Stephen. They were back home, vacuuming the house and mowing the lawn. Jessica felt a tiny stab of guilt. While they were working, she was going out for ice cream. But Jessica quickly pushed the thought out of her mind. After all, there was nothing she could do to change things now. She might as well enjoy her soda. Still, just to make herself feel a little better, she said, Mom, let's bring home some ice cream for Elizabeth and Stephen, too. Mrs. Wakefield smiled. That's very thoughtful of you, Jessica. We will. Mrs. Wakefield spent the next few days in bed, but instead of getting better, she seemed to get worse. She complained of feeling weak and achy and had a sore throat and a slight fever. On Monday afternoon, Jessica came home from school and told her brother and sister, tonight we're having pork chops, mashed potatoes and peas for dinner. Stephen, I'm putting you in charge of the pork chops. Gee, thanks a heap, he said sarcastically. And I put you in charge of being a royal pain in the neck. Very funny, Jessica said. But while we're joking around, Mom is upstairs, barely well enough to get out of bed. I know, but I'll make the mashed potatoes, Elizabeth volunteered. And I'll make the peas, Jessica finished. That isn't fair, Stephen complained. Throwing a package of frozen peas into a pot is no work at all. Stephen's right, Elizabeth nodded. Jessica, how about setting the table, too? I don't have time, Jessica said quickly. I have to make a cup of tea for Mom. Turning her back on her brother and sister, she walked to the stove to put on the kettle. Mrs. Wakefield insisted on coming downstairs to eat dinner with the children that evening. When the meal was over, she sat back in her chair and sighed heavily. She looked pale and thin, and there were dark circles under her eyes. Jessica looked at her mother across the table. 
Every day, Mom looks worse, she thought anxiously. You look tired, Mom, she said. Do you want to go upstairs and lie down? Not just yet, Mrs. Wakefield said. I have something to tell all of you. First of all, I want to thank all three of you for the wonderful work you've been doing around the house. I'm so proud of you. Then she glanced at Jessica. And I want to especially thank Jessica for taking such good care of me. She's been by my side every moment, fluffing my pillows, bringing me magazines, getting me drinks. A professional nurse couldn't have done better. Jessica saw Elizabeth and Stephen exchange a look of disgust. Ignoring her brother and sister, she smiled proudly and said, Thanks, Mom. Now, the big news, Mrs. Wakefield continued. Dr. Costa called this morning to tell me the results of my test. What did he say? Jessica asked, nibbling nervously on her thumbnail. Well, it was inconclusive. That means they still aren't sure what's wrong with me. But they do have a couple of ideas. There's a possibility I might have Epstein-Barr virus. Is that serious? Stephen asked. Not really, Mrs. Wakefield replied. The treatment is just rest, rest, and more rest. And after a while, it goes away by itself. That's good news, Elizabeth said with a relieved smile. But Jessica wasn't so easily reassured. What are the other possibilities, she asked. Oh, some other type of virus, perhaps. But what if it's something serious, Jessica insisted. She looked closely at her mother. She was almost positive she saw a worried look in her eyes. It could be, couldn't it? Well, all right, I'll be honest with you, Mrs. Wakefield said. I think you're all grown up enough to understand. Besides, I'd rather tell you the truth than lie and let you imagine all sorts of awful things. She took a deep breath. The lump on my neck may be more serious. There's a very tiny chance it may be cancerous. Oh, Mom, Jessica gasped. Cancer? Now, I don't want any of you to worry, Mrs. Wakefield said quickly. It's very, very unlikely that I have anything more serious than a virus. I'm going back to Dr. Costa tomorrow to have a biopsy done. He'll remove a tiny piece of the lump and look at it under a microscope. Then we'll know once and for all what's really wrong. Jessica felt shaky all over. Her dinner was churning in her stomach and her heart was pounding. Maybe we should call Daddy, she suggested. She longed to hear her father's comforting voice. He'll know what to do, she thought. It's too late to call tonight, her mother answered. Remember, it's three hours later in New York. I'll phone him tomorrow and let him know what's happening. And then he'll come home? Jessica asked hopefully. There's no need for that. Not unless the biopsy shows something more serious. But there's almost no chance of that happening. I hope you're right, Jessica said. But deep down, she had a frightening feeling her mother was very, very wrong. That night, Jessica lay in bed, unable to fall asleep. Over and over again, she kept hearing the words her mother had said at dinner. There's a very tiny chance it may be cancerous. Jessica swallowed hard. If her mother was really sick, she might be sick for months and months. She might even die. A wave of fear washed over Jessica. She tried to imagine life without her mother. Who could she talk to when she had a problem? Who would love her? She felt so awful that she forgot all about the rest of the family. She imagined herself all alone in the world, a poor, motherless child. A tear slid down Jessica's cheek and onto her pillow. She felt sure she was right. Her mother was dying. Soon she would be all alone. 
Jessica pressed her face into her pillow and sobbed. Finally, when she was too weak and exhausted to cry any more, she drifted off into a restless sleep. Chapter 6 When the alarm went off the next morning, Jessica woke up feeling tired and anxious. She sat up in bed and rubbed her eyes. The sun was shining brightly through the window, but Jessica's thoughts were as dark and gloomy as thunderclouds. Jess, are you awake? It was Elizabeth. She opened the door and stuck her head in the room. I've got a great idea. Let's surprise Mom by serving her breakfast in bed. Lizzie, Jessica said seriously, come here. Elizabeth walked into the room and sat down on the edge of the bed. What is it? Mom is very, very sick, Jessica announced solemnly. I think her voice caught in her throat. She's dying. What? Elizabeth asked anxiously. Who told you that? She must be. Dr. Costa doesn't know what's wrong with her, and she said herself it might be cancer. Just saying the word made Jessica's eyes fill with tears. Jess, don't be silly, Elizabeth scolded. Didn't you hear what Mom said last night? The lump can be removed, and besides, it's probably just a virus. I'm not being silly, Jessica insisted. Mom is sick, and no one knows what's wrong with her. It's got to be something serious. She reached out and clutched her sister's hand. Lizzie, I'm scared. Aren't you? Elizabeth sighed. Yes, she admitted. I am. A little. But there's no point in getting all worked up until we know all the facts. I know. You're right. But still, Jessica wiped a tear from the corner of her eye. Don't cry, Jess, Elizabeth said gently. Everything's going to be all right. I just know it is. She put her arm around her twin's shoulder and added, Listen, you don't have to get up yet. Stay in bed and I'll make breakfast for mom and you. Jessica smiled through her tears. Right then, she wanted to be taken care of. After the horrible night she'd had, she felt she deserved it. Thanks, Lizzie, she said, smiling weakly. You're the best. Later that morning, Jessica was in cooking class, learning how to make mashed potatoes. She and Leela were partners. They stood together over the stove, watching the potatoes boil. But Jessica wasn't thinking about potatoes. Her mother's biopsy was scheduled for 10 o'clock that morning. One of Mrs. Wakefield's friends from work was driving her to the doctor's office. Jessica glanced up at the clock. It was almost 10 o'clock. The carnival auditions are this Friday, Leela said. Have you been practicing your audition song? Uh-huh, Jessica replied absentmindedly. Your audition song, Leela insisted. Have you practiced it? You're going to have to sing awfully well to beat out Dana Larson. Leela was right, but Jessica couldn't think about that. Not until she knew if her mother was going to be all right. Uh, I've been kind of busy lately, she said. Oh, I almost forgot. Your mother. Did you find out what's wrong with her? No, not yet. Gee, that's too bad, Leela said sympathetically. I hope she feels better soon. She paused to turn down the heat under the potatoes. Too bad you couldn't come shopping with us last Saturday. Valley Fashions got in a whole new batch of jeans. I bought three pairs. Leela was still talking, but Jessica couldn't concentrate. Please let mom be okay, she thought as she stared into the boiling water. Please, please, please. She repeated the words over and over in her head. But no matter how hard she wished, she couldn't get rid of the horrible sinking feeling in her stomach. 
All right, class, Mrs. Gerhardt, the cooking instructor, told the class. The next step is to put the cooked potatoes into the bowl with the milk and butter. Jessica watched Leela dump the potatoes into their bowl, but her mind was wandering. How long would it take to get the biopsy results, she wondered. Last time the test had taken two days. How can I live through two more days without knowing, she thought miserably. Pick up your electric mixer and lower the beaters into the bowl, Mrs. Gerhardt was saying. Now turn the mixer on very slowly. Jessica turned on her mixer and thrust it into the bowl of mashed potatoes. To her horror, potatoes, milk, and butter flew out of the bowl and landed all over the counter. No, she cried, leaping back. The bowl overturned on the table and the mixer fell to the floor with a crash. Jessica Wakefield, Mrs. Gerhardt yelled. Didn't you hear me tell you to put the mixer in the bowl before you turn it on? She pointed at Jessica. Class, now you know what happens if you try to put a spinning electric beater into a bowl of potatoes. Everyone burst out laughing. Leela had gotten some potatoes on her sleeve, but even she was giggling. Jessica tried to smile, but her cheeks were hot with embarrassment. She felt humiliated, angry, and confused all at the same time. How can Mrs. Gerhardt expect me to concentrate on a stupid thing like mashed potatoes at a time like this? She thought with frustration. When Jessica got home that afternoon, she rushed to her mother's room. Mrs. Wakeka was lying in bed, reading a magazine. Jessica sat on the edge of the bed and took her mother's hand. How was the biopsy? she asked nervously. It was fine, her mother answered with a smile. Dr. Costa said he'll call me with the results on Friday. Jessica looked closely at her mother. She looked tired and weak. Her cheeks were sunken and her normally tanned skin was pale. Maybe she really is dying, Jessica thought suddenly. Oh, Mom, she cried, her voice catching in her throat. I love you so much. Jessica, Mrs. Wakefield said with surprise. What's wrong? She slipped her arms around Jessica and gave her a hug. I, I don't want you to die, Jessica sniffled into her mother's shoulder. Poor Jess, Mrs. Wakefield said gently. All that talk about cancer scared you, didn't it? Jessica nodded silently. Sweetheart, I'm not going to die, Mrs. Wakefield sighed. Believe me, everything's going to be fine. You'll see. Jessica wanted to believe her mother, but deep inside, she still wasn't convinced. Come on, Mrs. Wakefield said. Let's see a smile. Tell me, are you still saving your money to buy the unicorn sweater you saw at the mall? The previous week, the unicorn sweater had seemed like the most important thing in the world. But since her mother had gotten ill, Jessica had forgotten all about it. She sighed. I don't know. I suppose so. You've been such a help around here these last few days, Mrs. Wakefield said. Maybe it's too much to expect you to think about saving money right now. When I'm feeling better, you and I will go to the mall and buy you that sweater. Would you like that? Sure, Mom, Jessica said, forcing herself to smile. That would be great. But she couldn't help wondering if her mother would ever be well enough to go shopping again. Are you going to call Daddy this afternoon? She asked. Yes, as soon as Elizabeth and Stephen get home. I'll bet when he hears how sick you are, he'll come right home. Jessica said, hopefully. There's no reason for him to do that. And, Jessica, please, she added firmly. I don't want you to say anything that might upset your father. He's working on an important case, and there's no reason for him to be worrying about us. Understand? Jessica nodded reluctantly. I understand. When Elizabeth and Stephen got home, their mother called Mr. Wakefield's hotel in New York. 
Hello, Ned, she said cheerily when the call had been put through. How are you? A few minutes later, she calmly told her husband about the lump on the back of her neck and the tests Dr. Costa had done. Jessica listened anxiously. Suddenly, she had a horrible thought. What if something happened to her mother before her father got home? No, no, everything's fine, Mrs. Wakefield was saying. Dr. Costa is almost certain it's a virus. She paused. Yes. I'll call you as soon as I get the results. Okay, Ned, I'll put the kids on. Jessica listened while Elizabeth and Stephen took their turns talking to their father on the phone. Both of them talked cheerfully about things that were happening at school. Then it was Jessica's turn. Hi, sweetie, her father said. How's my girl? Jessica's knees felt weak. Come home, Daddy, she longed to cry. I'm scared. But then she remembered her mother's warning. I don't want you to say anything that might upset your father. Uh, I'm fine, Daddy, she managed to whisper. How's school? Anything new? No, not really. Is everything all right, Jessica? Mr. Wakefield asked. You sound awfully quiet. I, I'm okay. Good. Well, put your mother on again, will you? Jessica handed the phone back to her mother. It had taken all her strength to hide her fears from her father, and now she felt shaky and weak. After dinner that night, Jessica went down to the basement to practice her ballet, but she couldn't seem to concentrate on her warm-up routines. Instead, she put on a tape of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. The melancholy music suited her mood. When the music ended, Jessica turned off the tape and went upstairs. As she reached the top step, the phone started ringing. She walked into the den and answered it. Hi, a girl's voice said. Is this Jessica or Elizabeth? This is Jessica, she said. Who's this? Caroline Pierce. Is Elizabeth there? I need to talk to her about our meeting tomorrow. Jessica could hear someone coughing upstairs. Was it her mother? Jessica frowned. It was the first time she had heard her mother cough since she'd gotten sick. A shudder of fear went through her. Is mom getting worse? She wondered anxiously. Jessica, Caroline said in her prissiest voice. May I please talk to Elizabeth? I can't talk right now, Jessica said seriously, and neither can Elizabeth. Our mother is sick. She is? Caroline asked curiously. What's wrong with her? We're not sure yet. Listen, I have to go. You sound upset, Caroline persisted. It's nothing serious, is it? It might be, but, oh, poor Jessica. Caroline cooed sympathetically. You must be so upset. All day long, Jessica had been trying to hide her feelings. First in school, then on the phone with her father. Now she was too tired and too unhappy to try anymore. I am upset, she admitted. My mother is sick, very sick. No one knows what's wrong with her. It's scary. Oh no, Caroline gasped. Jessica heard her mother cough again, louder this time. Listen, I have to hang up. My mother needs me. Of course, Jessica, I understand. Jessica hung up the phone and hurried upstairs. By the time she reached her mother's room, she had forgotten all about Caroline's call.